Great, thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dev Reynolds, Epimorphics. Uh, we help people uh, publish and make use of uh, open link data. So I'm going to talk about, about water this time. We've had air, we've, um, we've had flooding. This, this is water, it's in the right place. It's water around the, around the coasts. And, and most of us enjoy going out and you know, uh, enjoy the natural environment around the coasts, whether it's some gentle swimming or something a bit more active or something indeed quite scary. But sadly, it's not always safe. Even if the water looks very clear and clean, there can be bacteria in it that can make you sick, leave you with respiratory or in those throat infections. We've actually come quite a long way over the years since um, this young lady died in 1957 contracting polio off but from swimming in water which was contaminated with raw sewage. Thanks to a lot of campaigning organisations and government agencies, we now don't dump raw sewage right next to where people bathe, and we're gradually improving and actually doing a reasonable job of improving the quality of, uh, of water around the, uh, around the country. And there's regulations in particular. The EU has a bathing water quality directive, which tries to set goals to how people go and improve the quality of water and, and defines how you go about measuring it. And the heart of that process is the work of the environment agencies going around measuring the quality of the water and the heart of that is data. So the story I want to tell is what happened when the Environment Agency was interested in taking that data right, and making it open data, and what happened as a result. So firstly, where does the data come from? There's quite a, mechanic, you know, there's quite a, a manual process. Somebody has to go out to each of the bathing water sites throughout the, throughout the season about once a week you know, and put, take a sample out of the sea and send it off to a lab and get it measured and, and measure what bacteria and the things there are in there, record that data, and then at the end of the season, they do an assessment, they take that, they take other information and say how good the quality of the water was then. And around this time of year, indeed, in a few, few days' time, you know, this year's results will come out and they'll be stacked up against uh, the goals set across, set across the EU. So going back about five years ago, uh, the Environment Agency was interested in releasing this as an open data set you know, there's public interest in bathing water. There's lots of partner organizations who, who could do things with this data. Uh, and it seemed like a nice scale of data set, interesting but not too enormous, to, to learn how to do open data and how to do open data well. So the approach they took was quite, quite nice. They wanted to take a, quite an incremental, you would call it these days, agile approach of putting something out, you know, see how it went. If it went well, they'd reinforce it, put more data out, you know, join it in. But they started with an idea of you know, what happens if we're successful, we want to lay good foundations. And the approach they chose was to publish a data in a form um, called, called linked data, which meant that rather than just publish the numbers, they also published all the reference information that describes and identifies all the important things in the data, the, you know, the bathing waters, the place where sampling takes place, the classification schemes, to allow them to connect other data sets in and slowly grow a bigger data set over, over time that people could exploit more richly. So the initial thing five years ago was to take a, a historical dump. They basically published a static archive containing the reference data and samples and assessments going back over about 20 years. They dumped it in, a, in a, a platform we provided for them. They exposed it as data dumps. They exposed it to query. Uh, and then they put in its face an API on top to allow developers to come and get access to the data in convenient format. Uh, and we produced a, a you know, simple web application, nicely geeky, to, to see what's in the data. And, and that seemed to go quite well. So the next year they thought, right, we're going to go to production. Uh, we want this to be updated weekly as it goes, you know, live data, updated weekly as it goes through the season. Um, but they added one more data set in, which is stuff called bathing water profiles, which describes much more about the bathing water. It's got information on the geology, uh, on the rain capture area, um, uh, on the, the locations of near store, uh, of local um, storm outflows and things that could affect pollution, as well as sort of descriptive text and what the sources of pollution, what's going on with them, pictures, the whole bit. But because of the approach they'd taken with getting the identifiers right first, they could just drop that data set in, it could just link right back into the other data, it could flow through, through the system with, with sort of minimal disruption. But that then meant we had much richer data to use to present the information. We could put up a website that you know, a member of the public could use rather, rather than a, a, a data geek, which would give you a sense of how the quality of the water is around the country, allow you to drill into an individual bathing water and see both the descriptive information, uh, you know, the statements about pollution, and the current live uh, quality information. So that was going quite well. Started to see some people, as well as just use the website, start to use the data. So in particular, Arup produced a, an iPhone application that would pull from the same API and allow you to check the quality of the water you know, near where you were or indeed anywhere in the country. So yeah, that was going well. So the next year, they then wanted to extend that further. 
Um, they dropped in one more data set, which is around suspension. So occasionally unusual things happen. You know, a bit of cliff falls off, cuts off the path, and they can't go down and monitor the quality of the water. So they suspend monitoring. In that case, you actually can't go down to bay, so it sort of doesn't matter to you. But abnormal events could significantly affect whether you want to go there or not. So they drop that data in. Again, it could just link right in, flow through the system. But much more significantly, we added a, a set of web widgets that would allow anybody to put live access to the bathing water data on their website. And you could customize the widgets to look at an individual bathing water or all bathing waters within geographic areas like districts and counties. And that was made possible by connecting to the linked open data published by Ordnance Survey. So it's starting to, uh, to grow the ecosystem a bit more. And those widgets were really successful in the sense that that's very low barrier to people putting the information up. We saw lots of uh, local authorities around the country, local tourist boards, people like that, uh, embed the information on their website. The Marine Conservation Society was one of the main lobbying groups in this area, uh, took those widgets and embedded it in their website, the Good Beach Guide, so that anyone going to the Good Beach Guide would see the up-to-date quality information. And we even saw physical devices appear. So this, this is viewed. Some of these put up a, a display on the beach that picks up useful information, including the current water quality. Uh, you, can, you can see if you can put something on a beach, it's hard to make. You have to armor it a bit so it will survive the, uh, uh, the seaside environment. But it's really nice to see sort of Internet of thing, Things sort of uh, sprouting out of this. Uh, then carrying on the next year, it was sort of business as usual. Um, there was one more data set to, to add in and sort of move to a more real-time actionable thing. So first of all, uh, they moved to daily update of the, the sample data. The samples weren't really taken more frequently, but there was less delay between them being available. But more importantly, for some bathing waters, they're heavily affected by rain. That rain falls, it washes nutrients and, and pollutants uh, down the rivers, it affects the bathing water. And you can do a predictive model that can say, tomorrow there's likely to be pollu a pollution event at this bathing water. Uh, we should warn people not to bathe there. And if you do that, you both help members of the public, but it also means that you can um, you know, put up notices and therefore don't need to do the monitoring at that time, so to speak. You know that people weren't bathing at, at that point. So it, it, it helps always round. And that forecast information, the Environment Agency runs a forecast model. They publish the data daily um, uh, into the same platform. Again, it drops right in, linked into the same data. It flows through the infrastructure. So anyone who's embedded the website, on, uh, embedded a widget on the website, automatically sees the predictive information. People who are pulling on the API can see the predictive information linked into their data and, uh, and start to exploit it. Uh, and then another third party was able to take that, that same interface and pull the predictive information out uh, and create a text messaging service so the beach operators could get an active text uh, saying there's pollution predicted at your beach tomorrow, put up signs, do something about it. So you're starting to get sort of actionable information flowing through. And then this year, there's been a huge change underneath that doesn't necessarily affect anyone else in the sense that the directive has changed or a new directive has come into force, which affects what you measure, how you measure it, how you report it. So there's been a huge change under the hood in the sense of the, how the data is formatted and how it's been put in. But the infrastructure allows it to flow through. There's been some small tweaks in the details. We had to do a lot of work to make it happen. But the data can carry on flowing through the same infrastructure. But we could then take the opportunity to update the website quite a lot and to present the information in the, in, in the new format, make it much more uh, useful for people. There's also been some changes between uh, there's now you know, sites for both England, uh, England and Wales and update the widgets to, to have the information flow through in the new formats. And some people like the Marine Conservation Society have then updated uh, uh, their website to make use of that data. Uh, we see more people, more local authorities using it. The uh, National Lifeboats uh, RNLI uh, put the information on their website. Uh, water companies are starting to pull on the data, and uh, Beach Live is a, is a service run by Southwest Water that has pulled in the, uh, the bathing water data and integrate, integrated that right in. The iPhone app, to be fair, has fallen a little bit by the wayside, but National Resources Wales also come alone and produced an Android app, which pulls the latest data. So if you're on Android, that's more, that's more interesting to you. But more interestingly, having got this broad reach of data flying out through the widgets, more and more of the partner organizations, people like Surface Against Sewage, Marine Conservation Society, the water authorities, can now see the value of the data. And they're going back to the API, pulling the live data themselves in raw format, integrating with their information, and then representing it to other people. So we're starting to see a, a really rich ecosystem of how the information flows out from the you know, starting point with the environment agency to a much richer uh, range of people than they would be able to have. Uh, than they were able to get to before. 
So from the environment agency's point of view, this is definitely a win-win story. It saves them money in the sense there's publications they no longer ha have to do. There are processes they had to do which previously would have produced PDF files that nobody in the world would read. They don't have to do that anymore. They can just point to the data and the data-driven website that's, that's driven of it. People get live up-to-date information. It reaches more people, and they just save that money. It reduces freedom of information requests, and there's a number of the ones they get in this area, they can just point them at the data, and they don't need to you know, pay the cost to, uh, uh, to answer them. The data is already there. But equally importantly, it increases the reach of the data. Much more people can see the data in a much more timely fashion because it has flowed openly and freely throughout this distribution network. And they found that it's enabled them to work much more easily with the, the partner organizations they work with because there's no question of, well, we can't see the data that you get or you only saw it a month too late. Everybody can see the same data at this, you know, in real time, so to speak. From the point of view of partner organizations, the earlier they can see information like there's going to be pollution tomorrow, the more they can act on it. It, it, it enables more effective decision making. And they, of course, take the information themselves, combine it with the data that they have that's particular to their area of interest, pass that on, enrich. And it gives them a historical archive they can use for generating insights and evidence for future lobbying and future long-term action. And I seem to have lost the screen. <laughs> OK, <laughs> fair enough. And of course, from members of the public, the key benefit is you can tell whether it's safe to go in the water. There's an easy-to-use site. There's iPhone apps, there's Android apps, whatever. You can go and check what the quality is going to be like uh, you know, of late and tomorrow as you go around the waters. So there's a couple of lessons from the approach that uh, the agencies took from this. First of all, by approaching this as a data service they were expecting to be able to enrich over time, they've created a much richer ecosystem than they could if they just created data dumps that people could come and, down, uh, can come and download. They've created an integrated system they can, they can extend incrementally. Critical to its success was to provide a wide range of varieties of ways to get access to data. data. There are some people who do just want the spreadsheet, the CSV file, they're going to do static analysis, they just want the data dump. For anything that's time sensitive, you clearly need an API, you need some way of getting the data in a timely fashion, and you need that. But certainly for this data, the gateway drug to that API was the widgets. You know, from, from only having an API to suddenly having widgets, there was a much broader uptake. And that led people to say, oh, we see the value in the data. We understand how to use it. We understand what we can do with it. Now we'll go back to the source and try to pull the, pull the raw data in machine-readable form and do things with it ourselves. And that, that's taken a few years to kick in, um, but it really has paid off for them. And finally, the technical approach of using linked data has worked really well, that we've been able to take this system and drop in data set after data set after data set, change aspects of the data, such as uh, how the classification scheme was run, and do that smoothly over time without interrupting the service, we're keeping the information flowing through. And that sort of agile data model was, was a key part of being able to grow this ecosystem so successfully. So thank you very much. That was interesting. Happy to answer any questions now or afterwards. Hi Dave, thank you very much. I think we have time for one quick question. One quick so question. if, does anyone have a question? <laughs> Tom's always got a question. Here we go. I should have guessed. I'm curious, <laughs> hi, hi Dave, Tom Heath from the ODI. So um, I'm curious about the, how the, the relationships with the, um, the downstream users of the data emerged, like Marine Conservation Society, Surface Against Sewage. Yeah, so we were talking over lunch. It, they start to use the data without you knowing that they're using the data in a way. We discover, oh, actually, I've just gone to that website, and I think that's the EA data, isn't it? Oh, yes, so it is. We can see that in the logs where that's coming in. So in a lot of cases, what they've done is to just start to use the data. Yeah, we put a lot of it into documenting and making it possible to, to people to self-start in this area. So in a sense, what happens is they've started to use it, and then we've spotted it, and then we've been able to reach out to them and talk to them. So for changes like this year when the revised bathing water and how measuring is done, by that time we knew who was using the data by that sort of detective work. Then we could go and talk to them actively about, you may want to know that whole, this whole thing is going to change, not because of the data, but because of the legislation. How are you going to present that to your users? How do you want to manage the transition? And you had a much more open working relationship. But it sort of went with them starting off using the information. You discover they were using it, and then you could start to talk to them. Fantastic. Thank you very much again. Thank you.